I've been getting a lot of questions about how do you know when is it, when it is appropriate to use uh, the concepts like conservation of energy, conservation of momentum, momentum impulse, and work energy, uh, which is a good which is a good question. Sometimes it can be a little confusing to know when to use what. So this is a very classic physics problem that hopefully will serve as an example of when to use what concept. So we don't have a lot of tools in our toolbox, right? We, If we're dealing with energy considerations, all we have is the conservation of energy and the work energy theorem. If we're dealing with momentum considerations, all we have is the conservation of momentum and the impulse momentum theorem. So we don't have a whole lot, uh, which is good news because we don't have a whole lot of options. Uh, so let's unpack a little bit of this, let's unpack this problem a little bit and see if we can get some insight into when to use what. So the situation in this problem is this. I've got a crate of mass M that sits on a frictionless track. At the beginning of its motion, it, it is at rest. Uh, it is compressing a spring, a spring constant K, compressed by some distance delta X. It's going to move on this frictionless track after it leaves the spring. It's going to cross over this uh, section, which I've labeled the distance D, which has a, a coefficient of kinetic friction, mu sub K. In other words, there's a rough patch on this track. Everywhere else, it's frictionless. And then it's going to move up this ramp to some height h, uh, after which, at, at which point it will have stopped. And we're going to be asked typically three things about uh, the motion of this crate. We're going to be asked for the speed at a, that is to say after it leaves the spring, how fast is it going. We're going to at, be asked for the speed at b, that is after it passes over the frictional patch, how fast is it going. And we're going to be asked how high up the ramp that this crate uh, does this crate go. What is the height h at which the crate stops. So we have three different sections of this problem. The first section is speed at A. And to solve this, I'm going to look at what I have. I'm going to ignore everything else past A. I'm going to ignore the frictional patch. I'm going to ignore the ramp. But what I have before the point A is I have a, a compressed spring and a frictionless track. And immediately when I hear the word frictionless, I start thinking of a conservation law. If there's nothing uh, that I'm allowing to bleed energy out of my system, that is, if I can easily define a system which does not lose energy uh, or does not lose momentum, I can use a conservation law, which are usually the easiest ways to go. So in this case, I've got a spring, which makes me think, aha, I know a formula for spring potential energy, uh, and I'm going to be in motion, and I know a formula for kinetic energy, and there's no friction in this part of the problem, I'm probably going to use conservation of energy. So when I write that down, I write down E total initial is equal to E total final. And now I have to unpack, right? I've, in those terms, I've got, I've got lots of stuff. So I've got uh, a kinetic energy initial plus potential energy and we'll call it, we'll say spring potential and then I've got gravitational potential, and these are all initials. All right, this should be a little I over here. There we go. And that's equal to kinetic energy final plus uh, spring potential final plus gravitational potential final energies. All right. So now let me ask myself: Are there any things that I can eliminate? Well, before I let this thing go, it's compressing the spring, but it's at rest. Right, so my initial kinetic energy is zero. Uh, I'm compressing a spring, so my spring potential energy is definitely not zero. But I have a formula for that. I know that my potential energy due to a spring is one half k delta x squared. That's my initial potential energy as a spring. Uh, for gravitational, if I'm smart about this, I'll set my zero point at the level of the track. So I don't have be a plus here. I don't have any gravitational potential. That will be zero. And so the total energy is just given by the potential energy of the spring initially. Now afterwards, let me ask you, let me ask what I have. Do I have kinetic energy? Yes, this thing will be moving. And I know a formula for kinetic energy, one half mv squared. Do I have spring potential energy? Well, this thing has already left the spring, so I don't have any more potential energy stored there. So that's zero. Do I have any potential energy? Well, I'm still at the same height that I was at the beginning, so I haven't gained or lost any potential energy. So no, I have zero potential energy as far as gravity is concerned. So what this boils down to, let me go to a different slide, is my initial energy is just 1 half k 
uh, delta x squared, and that has to be equal to my final energy, which is just one half. Uh, mv squared. Now what I'm looking for is v. I'm being asked to find the speed at a, which is right here. That's my final velocity. So I can I can uh, cancel the one halves. What I get out of this is v is equal to k over m under the square root delta x. Right. I, I, the delta x would be under the square root, but I just pulled it out because the square root of delta x squared is just delta x. And so uh, I have this easily found expression for the final velocity at a. And just from energy considerations, just knowing that there's because there's no friction, there's nothing to bleed energy out of the system. So my speed at a is going to be determined completely by energy, and I do a conservation of energy law, and I find the speed at a. Now I'm being asked to find the speed at B, right? So let's think through this physically. This is going to go over this frictional patch. Friction is going to take energy out of the system. The thing will slow down. This is just common sense. So if I have a force, and I do, I have the frictional force to bleed energy out of the system, then I cannot use a conservation law. It's very difficult for me to sum up what is, where all that energy went. So the easiest way to go is the work energy theorem. Let me go back over here. So for the second part, speed at B, I'm going to use work energy theorem. And I have uh, the work energy theorem says that the work is equal to the change in kinetic energy. The definition of work says that work is equal to uh, the net force times some delta x. Now, this is not the same delta x as was as my spring. right? This is how far... Uh, over what distance that force was applied. So we'll make a substitution there in a second, but don't get those confused. This delta x is the compression distance of my spring. This delta x is how far or what distance, over what distance my force of friction is applied. So the first thing to do here if I'm going to use work energy is figure out what all these things are. My force is the force of friction. And we know that that is mu kinetic times the normal force. If I look back over here, I'm on a flat surface, there's no incline at this point, so my normal force is just going to be equal to the weight of that object because I'm on a flat surface. So that's got to be equal to mu k m g. Uh, and this is going to be negative. Why, you ask? Because my frictional force will oppose the motion. It will be directed in this direction. Uh, my motion is to the right, the frictional force is to the left. It's going to be negative. Sorry, let me erase that. So that's my frictional force. Uh, my delta x, if I look back at the problem, delta x is the distance over which that force is applied. I've called that d. Okay? So I can make that substitution. And if I do that, what I get is that minus mu k, let me make that a subscript, mg is times d, is equal to the change in kinetic energy. You know what I've done? The left side of this equation is just straight from the definition of work. The right side will be from the work energy theorem, right? This I'm just calculating work in two different ways uh, due to the work energy theorem and due to the definition of work. So by setting the left side equal to the definition of work, the right side equal to the work energy theorem, I've got that that's one half m v final squared minus v initial squared. Uh, I, I've just unpacked the delta, right? Uh, I get 1 half m v final squared minus 1 half m v initial squared. I factor out the 1 half m, and this is what I'm left with. And what I'm looking for is this v final. Now, what's my v initial? My v initial is the speed that this crate had as it moves into the frictional patch because that's the section of the problem that I care about. And I've already calculated that. I've calculated that here. So what I'm going to plug in for my v final is this expression here, which I've already calculated. Let me get rid of those lines. Go to a new page. Uh, notice also that my m's will cancel. I've got an m in both sides of the equation. So if I go to a new page, I've got minus mu k um, times g times that distance is equal to one one half, uh, and this will be my v 
final squared minus my V initial squared, which I have here. It's going to be K over M delta X squared. K over M delta X squared. And there's a parenthesis there. If I solve this for my V final squared, I get V final is equal to, um, it's going to be K over M delta X squared minus 2 mu k g times that distance d square root because the whole thing is squared okay we'll solve the next part in the next video